So welcome to Mysterious Goings On. I am your temporary host, Brian Hutton. And uh, the reason I'm your temporary host is uh, I am joined by Alex Greenwood. And so uh, I've turned the tables on Alex. He interviewed me earlier in the season. This is a season uh, really focused on creativity. And so uh, I've turned the tables on him and, and wanted to interview him about his creative process and about the pilot series of books, which are now celebrating their 10th year in publication. And so we're talking a little bit about some of the events that inspired some of the uh, some of the characters in the books, as well as his creative process, and then also announcing an upcoming John Pilot mystery that will be released here at the end of October on Halloween. So, welcome, Alex. Well, thank you, Brian. And I might say uh, you're doing a great job sitting in my chair. And uh, thanks. <laughs> I'm having a lot of fun with this. I, and thanks again for the idea. Uh, sure. I, I think we mentioned it last time. It's like I didn't go to Brian and go, hey, interview me. It's just you, he just organically said, well, look, man. I'd love to talk to you about what you're doing after we talked. So it's right. it's been fun, and and uh, I I also appreciate the listeners' forbearance because I tend to <laughs> blather, but I get excited about these topics and just you know go. Sure. And there's a lot of it's been if you listen to the last week, it's kind of a rich tapestry of stuff that uh, went into the formation it, of the pilot series. It is, and for for me, you know, at having you know read the read the books, and I think a lot of the listeners have read have read the series. I, you know, a little peek behind the curtain. Uh, on on the process and and uh, I I think is is really fun for for me I I, I thoroughly enjoy enjoy that because you you really you honestly you do something that I can't do I, or I not well not certainly not as well as as you do oh, and so you. it's 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 fun to uh, to see how you uh, how you go about it so well thanks it's 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 really just a matter of of practice it's just. I really do believe that you're born with a certain amount of innate ability, but mm -hmm. it's it's the practice. It's the uh, I'm not as glib as Gladwell in saying if you do it for ten thousand hours, you're a pro. But <laughs> you, you do it enough, and you get better. So I thank sure. you so much. I appreciate that. Awesome, awesome. So, so last episode we talked a lot about the original event, the murder suicide at a college, and and that was some inspiration for you. But strangely, that that event happened in 1950. Right. There was a a similar event, maybe not similar, but it just as shocking to the university and to the community, event that happened much more recently. Yeah. It, I went to work at Peru State in 2003. I got hired by this very charming, very charming man. Uh, mm -hmm. I got called up. As we mentioned in the last episode, I had a lot of things going on in my life, and I was ready to get out of town. And I had basically uh, applied for this job. I think it was on like Monster dot com, and I got pulled okay. out of the stack on that and asked to come up. They they flew me up to interview. Wow! Uh, yeah, okay. from Oklahoma City to to uh, flew into Omaha, and then they the assistant to the president, a lovely lady, she picked me up and drove me in, and and I met uh, with. Uh, this gentleman that evening at the Lead Lodge in Nebraska City, beautiful place, and uh, he he said, "I'm drinking wine. I assume you are too." And I'm like, "Oh, I don't know. It's kind of a job interviewy kind of thing to not do." He goes, "Really?" And he just looked at me, and I said, "Okay, I'll 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 have a, I'll have some wine. How about a cab?" And so I, we both drank Cabernet, talked. I was immediately charmed by this gentleman. Uh, he was mm -hmm. fairly mm -hmm. elegant. He, he had a bit of an everyman thing going on, but uh, it was kind of under veneer though of. Every man made good. Do that make sense? Mm -hmm. Dr. Ben Johnson. He uh, told me about his life a little bit and about what he's doing at Peru State. And basically, what I learned that day, and then the next day when I spent literally all day in committee meetings, and it was like I lost my voice by the end of the day of all the people I had to meet, and I had to go do right. pan panel questions. I don't know if you've ever interviewed for a job at a university. Sure, I, I, yeah, I, right. On both uh, both sides of it. So I, I and I've. I conducted some oh. when I was student body president. That's right. When they were hiring, uh, when they were hiring 
when I was an undergrad. Yeah, right. So you know, and it's 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 grueling. I but I sure. I knew pretty much that I had the boss's seal of approval. Uh, I think by midday, it just seemed like the questions got easier, and as I fatigued, mm-hmm. I was I felt good about it. But but I learned that this gentleman, he th- this school was in trouble. This school is perennially in trouble. I think it, like a lot of you and I went to an undergrad school similar to this one in Oklahoma. Uh, a little more right. accomplished, but similar in the sense that it was always under the gun with budget. People are always wanting to close it because it's liberal arts. And Peru State was a, originally a pedagogical facility or institution, which just means they taught okay. teacher te- they taught people how to be teachers. Um, then they mm-hmm. expanded to a more liberal arts role, but they were always under the gun. And you know, we we talked about last time about how in 1950 the school was an under the gun. Well, right, right. They, they brought the uh, Dr. Johnson in. A few like a year or two before me, before I got there. So this was I don't know, turn of the just a little after turn of the century, I think. And he uh, he was already well on the road to to turning it around, and he was exciting, and and he had an energy uh-huh. about him, and I wanted to be part of it, and I wanted a job, and I wanted to get the hell out of Oklahoma. <laughs> um, so it all worked out. I got offered. No offense the job. to Oklahoma. Well, it the, it wasn't Oklahoma. It was just my circumstance in Oklahoma. That's right, what I right. meant. But I remember I got the phone call when I got home, like the afternoon the next day, and. He, he, it was Dr. Johnson. And he's like, I want to, I want you to come work with us. We, we were super impressed, blah, blah, blah. And I said, um, well, can I think about that? Cause I think you're supposed to think about it. You're not supposed to just say yes right sure, away. Sure. Yeah. Exactly. And I told him that. And there was a pause on the phone. Uh huh. And I was like, is that okay? And he goes, well, I, I just assumed that you were as excited about us as we were about you. <laughs> and I said, oh, hell, all right, Dr. Johnson, I'll take the job. Can you, you know, and we worked out some, he laughed and then we, he, but he, he had me there. He was just really good. And um, right. so I went and worked there. I was the, his assistant um, on public affairs and marketing. And I did marketing and public affairs there and his director. And um, as we mentioned last time, I was in the same building where all those murders took place, you know, 30 plus years before. Right. It was a great working relationship because I felt like I was truly his right arm in a lot of ways. Not for everything, but for those areas, he counted on me. He trusted me. Things went great. The first year, year and a half, uh, we instituted online learning, which most schools had not done yet. You folded that in, and our efforts, we had like a 19% enrollment increase. It was outstanding work. So it was really great. I loved the job. I missed my friends and family back in Oklahoma and stuff, but I was having a blast just getting paid to do something I was good at and meeting new people and just having a new experience, right? Sure. Um, which forms this basis for the cross township. You know, Peru, Nebraska becomes like the inspiration for cross township. So Dr. Johnson, we did, there's so many things I could go into with him, but about a year and a half in, mm-hmm. he just started turning a little bit. And I'd seen him kind of turn sour on other staffers. And I started noticing he was kind of digging at me and sniping at me about stuff that didn't make sense a lot of the time. It was like maybe I'd done something mildly wrong on something, but it wasn't like a job killer type thing. But it started to get more and more like that and a little more, a little verbally abusive at times. And I was just like, wow. And I kind of talked to him. I said, you know, what am I doing? You know, and he would just, long story short, he he would just kind of start doing the mind game kind of thing on me a little bit. I could see this because I'd seen him do it to others. And he started seeing people I was friendly with on campus and then started saying, I think you spend too much time with them. I think you need to not have lunch with them anymore. I worked really well with somebody at admissions and, you know, and he was, he started implying that I was trying to do something with her inappropriate. He, he started uh, that kind of thing. And and I was starting to feel very isolated. And I, I was a little fragile emotionally after going through all this stuff I'd gone through before I got there. Right. Deaths, right. a couple of deaths, uh, near-death experience for myself, loss of status, loss of an election, all these things. And, sure. and, he, and I was isolated. Let's add to that. Yeah, you were, you were also physically isolated, yeah. being in a very remote, very rural kind of atmosphere away from all friends and family. Right. And literally isolated yeah. by the weather a lot. It, it, when it snowed up there, you, well, you live in Chicago, mm-hmm. right? I mean, you, 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 this was the first time in my life I'd experienced four foot snow on a regular basis. Right. And just right. And, and this little tiny town, you get socked in, you're socked in. And these are very hardy people who are used to this, but they, they just understand when it when the when the when the snow flies like that, we're stuck. Mm-hmm. Better have some stock food stocked up or trudge down to the one grocery store that's actually about the size of a quickie mart. Or maybe the Casey's, it's famous for pizza, and and, and that's it. And you, or and cell phone service was kind of spotty, and so the phones went down. You were kind of it just really was isolating, right? And 
I just, I started seeing him, and looking back, I noticed he was doing a lot of isolating things to me, isolating my, my relationships. Mm-hmm. My girlfriend, who is now my wife, came to visit, and he was trying very much to talk me out of dating her, and he wanted me to date a gal who worked at the foundation, so much so mm-hmm. that he was pushing me to ask her out, and I just couldn't do it. I was She was very attractive, very nice, but I had nothing to in common with her, but he was pushing right. me constantly, and he was like, "Oh, well, you know, Stephanie's nice, but you should talk to, to you should you should start dating this other person." I was just like, "Right, okay," mm. but he do it kiddingly. But you know, when your boss is kind of there, and he's becoming less a boss and more kind of a king to you in a lot of ways because he has all right. this control over your life and all this, so that kind of behavior. And he would say things to me about other people, and he, I'll never forget this. He once told me. We had a lot of time together in the car or just in the office or whenever, or we'd go out to dinner every now and then. I'd say, oh, it's a shame about so-and-so being moving on, uh, somebody who ostensibly either quit or got let go. And He said, well, you know, I'm of the mind that people are like newspapers, and when you're done with them, you just throw them away. And, and then he kind of had a little bit of a rueful laugh, but I don't think it was. Right. I don't think he was trying to be funny. And right, I right. was like, "Whoa, okay." But by the same token, everything was going great for the school. Everything was. We were mm-hmm. achieving, and the, the the school's budget pressures were going away. And the state, the senator, he was the darling of state senators, and and people talking about, "Oh, this is the guy who gets it. He saved the school, and he he created some brilliant stuff." And I can't take that away from him. I cannot take away any of those achievements from him. I can't because he did some things that put Peru State on the map. He was a visionary about online education. Everybody mm-hmm. laughed at him about online. They're like, oh, I, I, hell, I even taught online for a year. I taught marketing. I, so I was like, I, even I knew then, it was like, well, I think this is a good idea. And I really believed in it. And that's why our enrollment increased. And now, look, everything's online practically. Not everything, but you mm-hmm. know what I mean? It's, it's ubiquitous. These things were happening. And I remember socially, though, he was, he was just a little different. He was a little off. I mean, we, mm-hmm. we had a bowling league. <laughs> yeah and i and it was uh me and a couple of dudes from the school and i just remember this is that i was the worst guy in the team but that got me the mvp trophy because <laughs> my handicap saved the team we won the championship <laughs> but i remember like would you get a strike and you would do a fist bump mm-hmm. to everybody ben really hated that hmm. dr johnson did not want to fist bump anybody and he said repeatedly why do we have to do this and he, he was irritated mm-hmm. i think it mm-hmm. there was something about it that bothered him and I, I don't even know what that means. I just remember that. <laughs> I, I, looking back, I realized how inappropriate some of this behavior was. Right. Receiving right. gifts, like he'd give me, like he, he loved to collect uh, watches, timepieces, nice ones. Mm-hmm. He'd buy them on mm-hmm. eBay and stuff like that. And I always liked good watches, but I didn't really have any good watches at the point. And he gave me like a couple. That, and I just was mm-hmm. like, well, thanks. I can't accept this, but thanks. And he's like, oh, of course you can't take it. So he would do okay. all these kinds of things. I, I'm trying to just kind of lay this out for you a little bit to let you know where he was. So he, he had his really great side. I hate to be so glib as to say Jekyll and Hyde, but it was very much. But after about mm-hmm. a year and a half, it just started to get worse. I just remember he was brittle about anybody getting more attention than him on anything, which is also kind mm-hmm. of a, mm-hmm. not a good thing for people with certain personalities. Right. We were at a, a state college meeting, and it's the meeting of the three colleges. Peru's one of them, Wayne State and Shatter and the other two. And as I recall, we were in a committee meeting or something, but um, somebody, a third party who didn't work at Peru, looked at our enrollment numbers and our marketing and said, oh my gosh, we're going to have to steal mm-hmm. Alex Greenwood away from, from Ben. <laughs> right. At, that was it. It seemed that from that moment on, I was no longer fair-haired boy with my boss. I was apparently somebody who was uh, a threat to my boss. And even though right, I was helping right. him and just, just doing everything I could to make him a success and make Peru a success. And uh, he changed. He was very cold to me at that point. And he would berate me and behind closed doors. He would criticize my job performance. He, he brought me in one day and he had a few just, I thought, silly things. He says, this is going in your record. I was like, what, what did I do? He goes, this, this, and this. it was just all this stuff. And he was, and he knew how psychologically I was already feeling isolated. And I was, mm-hmm. I was frankly depressed. The weather, I think I had a little bit of seasonal affective disorder and at times going on. I can just remember he did all these things. He built me way up and mm-hmm. he, he read this newspaper. He got everything out of me he could get, I think. And mm-hmm. then he started finding ways to tear me down to get me to leave. Right, right. So... Almost two and a half years in, um, 
I couldn't take it anymore. I mean, it was literally every day was like, is he going to yell at me or is he going to pat me on the back? Is he going to tell me I did a great job or is he going to tell me not to eat lunch with my friend Les in the cal- in the uh, cafeteria anymore? You know, is it is it this? Um, is he going to accuse me of trying to sleep with somebody in a different department? Is he going to do, you know, all these things. And I decided I, I got to get out of here. So I started looking for work in Kansas City and Stephanie and I talked about it and she was in Kansas City and and I let it slip. You know, I thought I could trust. Mm-hmm. who was probably just as scared of him as I was. So she she kind of, in my opinion, toadied up to him and said, well, hey, I, Alex just told me he's looking for a job. So I got called in the next day by Dr. Johnson. He said, here, you're looking for work. And I said, yeah. And he said, well, let me just make it clear to you. Uh, this was like, I think, August. He said, mm-hmm. if you uh, if you don't have a job by October, you, you might as well just go ahead and walk because you'll be fired at that point. Wow. Completely illegal, by the way. Yes. But it was just me and him in the room, and how could I prove it? And I was just like, well, okay. Right. Well, well fortunately, within a couple of weeks, I had a job. I was, vice, I was vice president of a TV station in Kansas City, so I was on my way. So it's further proof, by the way, that I was very good at what I do, and obviously uh, a very— sure. He just wanted me out of there. So this is the thing. So then everybody knows I'm going. So I think I'm leaving by, yeah, October, November, I'm leaving. Like, before I go— Dr. Johnson has a uh, going away dinner for me at a local restaurant. And I didn't want anything to do with him. And he was all, <laughs> he was all pat me on the back and glad handing mm-hmm, and aren't mm-hmm. you great. And, and all these people there and, and they gave me like some going away stuff. I don't remember, but it was just as if, Oh, this is our wonderful hail fellow. Well met. He's done so great. We're going to, we're going to miss him and all this. Hmm. It, it, it was a, it was like he was like doing PR with everybody else, I guess. Or, but in a way, I took right. it as him basically saying, "Screw you." By the way, it's like he looked me in the eye, yeah. shook my hand to send me away. It's like this is what I do. Right. I right. felt it was very creepy. So, what year was that? That was late twenty oh five. Okay. Okay. So shortly after that, now there are th- some things right. going on in the background. Right. Well, so I go away, and I'm the TV station, and that's 2005, and I hear some things here and there, and then I hear that oh, he's going to retire in 2008, and he retires in 2008, mm-hmm. and I think, well, you know, you know, son of a gun, he he did some things I don't really appreciate but you know what ultimately he's a complex personalities are often incredibly good leaders and he did a really great job with the school and uh, it's a chapter in my life that's over it, it was hurtful in a lot of ways because I, I i made friends for life i thought there and i thought i'd done such a great job and i was liked and it took me a lot of years to realize that all those things were true and that this wasn't about me it was about him and to a large degree i mean i wasn't perfect but you know what i'm saying sure so i'm hearing that he's consulting and he's he he'd raised a lot of money for the school so he had had kind of a been given a really nice role with the uh, foundation uh mm-hmm. to raise money i think he was getting a well we'll find out he was getting um a nice compensation package it was kind of a deferred con- compensation package and some stuff like that, right, that, right. that by the way now is illegal in nebraska anyway so we get to around uh spring of 2010 and uh, somebody who I used to work with at Peru calls me and says, are you sitting down? I said, yeah, I'm sitting down to lunch. What's up? She says, well, I just need to tell you something. Ben took a job in uh, at a university. At Fair- Fairmont. Yeah, at Fairmont State. And uh, it was just announced in March. And I'm like, well, that's, that's great. And this was like late April or early May. And mm-hmm. I said, well, that's great. I, I, I expected he would take more jobs, although he was getting up in years. And I don't know why, but, you know, mm-hmm. I guess he needed the money. And she said, well, the attorney general of the state of Nebraska has been looking for him and uh, filed some, I basically is going to file an indictment. And uh, uh, Ben took his life. Ben took his own wow. life. The press release at Fairmont State said that he accepted the job in March of 2010. And by April, back to another April date, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. just like 1950. Ben, Ben, basically, what was happening was they found out he had been embezzling, um, right? And right. I don't, I don't. So that was the bookstore funds, correct? Right, bookstore funds, and he had been. I mean, and I'll just say it. This is from the Lincoln Journal Star. The former president of Peru State College apparently used about forty three thousand four hundred dollars from a university related account to pay personal bills. State Auditor mm-hmm. Mike Foley said. 
uh, who Ben Johnson, who left the college in 2008, also didn't reveal a felony conviction and misled college state college leaders about his previous employment when applying for the presidency at Peru. Right. He, he committed and he had put it on its uh, on the previous jobs letterhead, even though he was been fired. no longer working there. Right. Right. Yeah. He was basically paying off thousands of dollars to his American Express account for clothing, for food and meals, for home supplies, travel, including airfare, motel, and a cruise. Uh, mm. They did not appear to be related to Peru state activities. President for nine years, from 99, okay, it was 99 until August of 08. He was living in Florida since then and was recently named an administrator at Fairmont State. In addition to his apparent misuse of college funds, the staff also discovered he did not reveal a 1989 felony conviction in California where he applied for the Peru job. He, mm -hmm. as you said, he said he also used letterhead for his resume, cover letter from a college where he was no longer employed. So, and, and then add to that yeah. the, that deferred compensation package. So, mm -hmm. so that was actually even larger and and stranger, I I believe. So he he had managed to get nearly half a million dollars in deferred compensation that they canceled actually they they caught the deal and it was supposed to be that yeah he he had negotiated right. that um yeah and the thing that gets me is you know he didn't reveal this felony he he made an untrue statement or omission to state material facts to investors in a scheme and he spent nine months in a california county jail i mean wow. <laughs> nine months in jail um <laughs> his cover letter seeking the peru state job was on thomas college letterhead he had signed the letter as a vice president at the school and he'd been terminated from thomas college in thomasville georgia two months earlier Mm -hmm. um, he had later filed a civil suit against Thomas College for breach, and the school responded that Johnson misrepresented his qualifications in applying for the right. job. The suit was dismissed four months after Johnson was hired at Peru. Yeah, he failed to disclose more than 450000 in deferred comp. And that led to, I would jump ahead just a little bit, just to kind of tie a bow around that, a, a state law. Uh, LR-431, right. that uh, the state of Nebraska no longer allow it requires that all those that type of compensation be revealed out in the open and and I have not read the law in its entirety but I think they the, the like the regents or others need to be aware and approve of, right. of any type of compensation uh, of that kind so. yeah and, and perhaps I think it probably also means that a lot of my former colleagues at the Nebraska State College system were looking a lot more closely at resumes and checking criminal records I mean <laughs> I Jesus so. Christ I mean <laughs> you verify people this guy is a, this is a convicted <laughs> felon this is a former convict yeah. who has basically charmed his way into a position of authority and he mm -hmm. clearly as you said exhibited some pretty criminal and I'm not going to say sociopathic, I'm, but I'm going to say some clearly some antisocial behaviors. Yeah, and certainly, yeah, qu questionable, questionable history. Paul Fell, who was president of the college alumni group, I met Paul a few times. He was a Lincoln cartoonist, a Peru graduate. He said the guy just did miracles down there. He took the place and turned it around. The former chancellor of the, the college said, "I'm sad that it turned out this way. That would have been a very good legacy is tarnished. Yeah. But here's the thing, too. The man was very skillful at turning away people who helped him achieve all these things. So I have to wonder about him. Did mm -hmm. he turn away and start scaring away people who perhaps had, and I'm not being aggrandizing here, but did, who had stronger personalities and who could threaten him in the sense that if they found out what he was doing, they would have the the moral fiber to report it and not just cower. If right, I found right. out he was embezzling, I would have gone straight to the, to the cops about it. I sure. Mean, you sure. Know, if he, had, if he, and, had, and yeah. he, he seemed to uh, maybe block relationships that might, uh, since each person at the university has one piece of the puzzle. Yes. It, he may have blocked some of those or, or tried to frustrate some of those relationships, knowing that if two or three, got together and said, oh, well, I saw this piece and I saw this piece that you might be able to piece together e even mm -hmm. more of that activity as I th well. I think so. he ran off a lot of good people, not just me. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I am not perfect. And again, yeah. there were probably some aspects of my job I could have done better from time to time, just like anybody else. So please don't anybody think I'm sitting here going, I was perfect and he ran. Right. But this guy did some stuff. 
There were other things I'm not going to go into. There's rumors and stuff like that that I will not go into on this thing out of out of respect for his the people who loved him. Mm-hmm. But I believe a lot of those rumors because now that I put in retrospect, put the pieces together, he mm-hmm. did some really questionable things. Obviously, that he I mean, and, and not just at Prue again. This is an ex-con. This is a former felon who basically got in trouble for, I think, defrauding investors. Right. And then he 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 def- he, he fraudulently attains attains more than one job because of his mm-hmm. credentials, mm-hmm. and then because he doesn't t- you know talk about his past, and he walks into this job at proof. So it's like some people are like. Here's a parallel. Well, the economy's so good, so we can forgive all the other <laughs> bullshit that the president's doing, right? It's like, no, right. either we're a no, moral and just society or we're not. Sure. So yep. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little worked up because this was a like a two side of the coin thing for my life. One side mm-hmm. was like, I, I, I broke away from everything and I started over and I killed it a year and a half or so. And then, frankly, through no fault of my own, I was shown the door. Right, right. And it, it breaks my heart because, frankly, uh, I felt like I could I could have had a whole new career. In fact, I'll tell you this. You know what he did do? He did some wonderful things for me, too. He wrote me a great letter to get me into the executive MBA program at University of Nebraska at Omaha. I got accepted. I was going to go. This mm-hmm, happened mm-hmm. a few months before the alleged, or the alleged, before the, the incident of me being praised at a meeting. Right. Right. And then when he started turning on me, I was like, there's no way in hell I'm staying here. And therefore, I'm sure. not going to go spend 50 grand on a executive MBA in the, at, at, at uh, UNO. Mm-hmm. So he, mm-hmm. he would do these things. And he would tell me, he said, you could be a college president someday. He said, you you could run a small college. He said, you've got what it takes and all this stuff. And then I realized, oh, of course I could. In his eyes, <laughs> of course I could. You know? Yeah. But I, I just remember he had plenty of enablers on staff. Some people who I'll never forgive. For the way they they enabled him, but then he had some people mm-hmm. who I remember who questioned him, and they were shown the door, or their lives were made miserable. I wasn't the only one, and then there were some people who who legit were were dead weight, probably needed to go or needed to have their roles changed, and he did that too. Right. So right. I, I I don't mean to, to beat a dead horse. I just want to lay this out. <laughs> so if you go back to 1950, you have this horrible tragedy, right, where somebody who's got issues goes in a very bad direction. Then you go all the way up. To 20, uh, 2010. 2010. Yeah. So you got mm-hmm. you got sixty years here, a span of sixty years where it ends. The, the punctuation is sad, and sadly, the punctuation or these things are, are gunshots. And right. listen, as much as I despise a lot of the things Ben did to me and said to me, and the hurt he caused me, I believe it or not, still have a lot of respect for his achievements, and uh, mm-hmm. and I have I have love for him in some ways because there were he did. No matter what, at the ultimate end, he did help me kind of get to where I needed to be at that time in my life and, and introduce me to some other wonderful people. Right. And we didn't even get into how this guy, by the way, talked himself into being a nationally known lottery expert. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I don't. Even, we right. don't have time for that whole right. story. But and the book writing. Uh, yes. The, the, he wrote lots of textbooks. In fact, I'm sitting right, here looking right. at Stirring Up Thinking, his critical thinking textbook, which I think is a pretty darn good textbook. I mean, but mm-hmm. he... he mm-hmm. He's fascinating in that he did. He, I'll just tell you real quick. He told me one day about, he was like, and this was a guy, he told, the story he always told me about himself was he grew up on the streets of Detroit. And this is what he said. This was the lore he established. He said, well, I was a, I was in gangs and I get into knife fights. And then I got in front of a judge who said, you can either join the army, go to jail or go to, go to college it was in, you know, but you got a choice or something, something like that. It was one of those kinds. It was just right out of, you know, and right, right. anyway, so he, obviously, you know, the path he took and. He would always kind of jokingly allude to all his friends back in Detroit to people, you know, he would you know, I've got to introduce so and so to some friends I have back in Detroit. And I was just like, okay, whatever. I never took that too seriously. <laughs> but he he told me one day, he said, Yeah. He says, you know, I just once I decided I would become an expert on the lottery. And he he boned up on it, but he 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 would just gleefully told me how he started writing this column for the local paper and then it got syndicated and he's like, And I don't know shit about the lottery, but I pretended like I did and he's written some books. Mm-hmm. It's just typical behavior of this kind of personality. And again, I'm not diagnosing right, right. him. I can't, but I mean, yeah. do, do I need to paint a picture? I mean. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. It's very interesting. So, so and I, I don't mean to, to continue to blather on him. So I won't, other than to say there is a villain in mm-hmm. Pilot's Cross who right. hangs around for a couple of books and he was uh-huh. the president of Cross College. But is that yeah. Ben? Well, no. Right, no. right. It, is he inspired by Ben somewhat? Well, I would imagine so. 
Right, right. Yeah. So the Peru State community, mm-hmm. how did they react? You, uh, you said a little bit about, the, you know, there was some some shock there, but there was also, I, I mean, some some pretty nefarious activity as w- was being revealed by the state attorney general as well. In the, yeah, and the auditor too. And I, I think the people I talked to, it was a mix. It was like... It was like you, know, you heard some of these quotes publicly because he did. Mm. Listen, if that college dries up, that town dries up and blows away. You, you know what I mean by that? There's nothing economically sure. there other than farming. Right. It was a love-hate relationship because I think a lot of them, and this did translate into Jack Lindstrom a little bit, that the town thought, I think a lot of people in town thought he was kind of full of himself and blah, 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 but they couldn't argue sure. with results because a lot, of them, a lot of them were farmers, but their wives or their husband or their kid worked at the school. And the right, school right. definitely kept the, the gas station open and the grocery store open and the bank and all that. So mm-hmm. it was a mixed thing. But I, and I, I, I'd spoken to some other friends there who were bitter and said, you know, that's all we need in this town is, 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 is this. Uh, you know, and I even had one say to me, you know, after the yeah. thing that happened in 1950, and then we, you know, we, we worked so hard to get past that, you know, as a town. And then we get up here and we, and, and and one guy said this this jerk comes to town and <laughs> and does this and it ruins it for us. It does well. And then yeah. a few years later, there was and I think it's still unsolved. There was a student who was apparently uh, was it well has disappeared was, was likely mm-hmm. murdered and that it's just there's some bad luck going on there. I don't I don't believe in curses and I don't believe in that. I think statistically right. bad things happen everywhere. It's just when sure. you're it's such a small concentrated place when a big when a big personality comes to town. And does mm-hmm. big personality things, good or bad, it has an effect on people. Right. Um, you know, I've never talked publicly about this until now because, but he's been gone now for 10 years. Nine months, years. Nine, yeah, it'll be, 10, it'll yeah. be 10 in spring. And, and I, again, he had family and he had friends. And, and I, I hope if they're listening to this, they don't think I'm trying to be malicious. I, I, I held my tongue for a long time. But the man did hurtful things, and right, we all right. do hurtful things in our lives. But he did hurtful things that legit could hurt, that hurt people's careers, that mm-hmm. mess with their their brains a little bit. Mm-hmm. So I just felt like I should say it. And I hope anybody who wants to defend him feel free. I don't really want to argue about it. It's how I feel. Right, right. I'm not saying anything here other than my own experience that isn't verified in the newspapers. I, I went and visited there a few years ago on my way to a book signing. And I ran into a few friends. It was great. I hope, though, that people, when they see his achievements, like the little schoolhouse he re- remodeled, that was one room schoolhouse. He he had this whole. Pro- he moved to a schoolhouse to campus, and because it was a teachers' college, and he redid the school. It was beautiful. I hope when they look at the Arc, the Academic Resource Center, which is just the jewel of Southeast mm-hmm. Nebraska higher ed. I hope when they look at that, they'll think fondly of Ben. Because I, I try right. to. I try to. I mean, it's obvious listening to this interview. I have mixed emotions, but sure. if, you can't sure. argue that. He did some damn good things. Well, that's good. That's good. And I think we're all, I, we're all multifaceted as people. And all of your characters, it's maybe a, an interesting segue into mm-hmm. antagonist. All, yeah. all of your characters are multifaceted. It, no one is all, or very few, uh, all bad yeah. or all good. We're all struggling with our past in internal demons and, and those type of things. So speaking of antagonists, Mm -hmm. who's your favorite? Oh, wow. Oh my God. That's a, thanks. And first of all, thanks for calling him antagonist (laughs) because villain is too, you see, if you'd said villain out, you would have been contradicting yourself because to me, a villain is boring, a black and white, just I'm evil. Well, that's right. Right. Yeah. Twirling, twirling a mustache. Because nobody, you know, no good villain thinks they're really being villains. They think that, sure, they they think that evil things they do are means to an end, and and it's a good thing. And even if that good thing is only to feather their own pockets, right, um, right. or get power, or they're like, look, sure, I pocketed some forty grand worth of money, but look what I did for this school. It was worth ten to a hundred times more than that in value. But so right, people, right. so in seven books now, there's been out of the antagonists. Well, there's Ben Jack Lindstrom, who was the president, and and mm-hmm. if you haven't read these books, there's a, this is a little spoilerish, but read them anyway. You're going to enjoy yourself. Uh, he's he's doing some some kind of shady things, and he's kind of found out. And then uh, in Pilot's Key, there's 
there's pirates, basically. I don't mean it like, Arr, pirates, but they're like, <laughs> it's the Bahamian. He's called the Bahamian. He's a guy from the Bahamas, and there's drugs, and there's okay. stuff like that. Um, mm-hmm. He's all right. He's a little bit of a cutout. Um, I'll admit that. And then then Ghost, we have a, a guy come back who could be somebody we've heard of before, and he's just off the rails crazy and doing some crazy stuff. So I like him a lot. Mm-hmm. Then in Blood... Back in because it goes back, it goes from Nebraska in the first book to uh, to uh, Key West in the second book, and then in uh, uh, Pilot's Ghost, he's in both places, mm-hmm. and then in Pilot's Blood, Pilot is firmly back in Cross Township, and he's like the constable, and he's dealing with the guy who filled the vacuum from the mayor because the mayor also was evil in the first book, or was a mm-hmm. excuse me, not evil, was the antagonist, uh, 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 right, right, and he he but he ended up, I'll just say he ends up gone but but there uh, the vacuum is filled by this guy who's related to him he comes in from the the minnesota mafia and (laughs) and i like him a lot because he's very nuanced he's a businessman Mm -hmm. his name is hilmer thurman i like him a lot he's probably the least god i don't want uh, i'll use the word he's probably the least cartoony of the villains and when i say cartoony i don't mean like oh haha these are terrible villains it's just or the or here i go i called him villains antagonist but he's but jack lindstrom is like Okay, clearly, you know, businessman does some things that are shady, blah, blah, blah. Then you got the, you got the drug dealer in the next book, and then you got this shadowy guy who has connections back to Pilot's Cross. And then you got the Hilmer Thurman, who's filling in for the mayor who, who was taken out in Pilot's Cross. And I like him. There's a scene where Pilot and him meet at, like, this. there's this rib joint that's being run. It's on the edge of town. It's the rib shack. And, or maybe it's at the Brown Betty Bar. It's at one of these places. And they're... And then Hilmer Thurman has just this little, because if you see a lot of this stuff, you, you see a lot of these crime bosses and they don't have mm-hmm. opulent offices or anything. They live in a little tiny place because they don't want to draw attention themselves. You know? Sure, sure. Yeah. Most successful criminals are successful because they don't draw attention themselves. They don't flash money around or that. Mm-hmm. Pilot mm-hmm. has a scene with him and Pilot is so nervous. I think his leg is just like constant movement leg syndrome under the desk and he's sweating and, and they're back and forth thing. And he, he kind of threatens or he kind of insults this, this guy and the guy, he gives it back to him and there's no yelling at all. It's all just, so mm-hmm. I really like Hilmer and in Rose, um, it's kind of complicated. Uh, the villain in Rose is kind of like a James Bond villain to a degree. Uh, he's all right. Um, <laughs> yeah, some of these are maybe inspired loosely on a person or multiple people mm-hmm. that you've known, you've interacted with. Sure, but you but you throw them into a maybe an extreme situation, or or right. have them make a a de- bad decision or a series of bad decisions to get them where they are. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So 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 given that. You know, has anyone that's ever seen a, a bit of themselves in those characters been offended? N- not that they said to me. Um, okay, I think indirectly somebody I think back at Peru, and I I couldn't tell you if this was just hearsay or what, but it kind of got back to me. Somebody was like, "Oh, you know, really? You know, I think I think some people who have glanced at these who live in that area." are not flattered that again, it's obvious that it's inspired by Peru and maybe they're not thrilled with that because it's more salt in the wound kind of thing. But I've not heard anybody go, believe you, you made me into yeah, this bad guy. This bad guy. I think, have I, gosh, I probably have had, or, I, I can't uh-huh. think of anything right off the top of my head, but I, I mean, it's, it, yeah. I would be probably more flattered than anything. Cause that meant somebody <laughs> really read it carefully. And most people don't, they're just like, that was a good book, man. I'm like, well, what'd you like yeah. about it? You know all of it, <laughs> yeah, right? Like, right. Yeah, yeah, okay, you didn't. You didn't really read it, did you? I wanted to ask you about the name John Pilot. Oh, how did John? Wow. Uh, how did John get his name? <sighs> okay, that's a. That's a. I. I gotta say, it's it's been um, it's been a regret of my. <laughs> <laughs> because it's spell it's Pontius Pilate is is the inspiration. I'll just I'll tell you that first. Yeah. And I'll tell you about okay, the regret. Okay, sure, sure. So Pontius Pilate was the Roman governor who got the un- unenviable job to placate the Jews and also deal with this problematic guide called Jesus. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. And there was a lot of Jewish people there who wanted him out, and there was a lot of Romans who were like, "Can we just you know?" And, and right. Pilate just—I don't think Pilate had any skin in that game. He was just like, "I'm the governor. 
you know, there's that famous line where he's like, I got to wash, I'm going to wash my hands of this. And, you know, he's washing mm-hmm, his hands. Mm-hmm. But I liked the idea of using religious imagery throughout the books. And I have to a degree. It's kind of dropped off here and there, but my editor and I were working on this new book. It comes back. Mm-hmm. I like the idea of religious imagery. There's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of threes in my books. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, uh, if you kind of mm-hmm. parallel to threes. You, you, if you look for threes hard enough, you're going to find it in just about every book. That's why okay. I, I swear originally, by the way, this was supposed to just be a trilogy, but, you know, it didn't happen that way. So now it's <laughs> double that so far. I like the idea, though, that Pilate was a guy who kept, who got dragged into something. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because if you look at the entire character arc of John Pilate, he just gets dragged into stuff. Right, right. There's no in. He he doesn't intentionally go to 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 look for these for no. for for trouble or or to solve things. No, he's the guy in the first book who was coming off a very bad divorce, lost his mm-hmm. job. He's he had some kind of potential uh, life threatening illness, and he goes to a new town. He's just like, I want a fresh start. And then what's he get when he gets in the fresh start? He gets dragged into a conspiracy and he nearly you know gets killed and then if you look if you look at all of these pilots key he's just having dinner at a restaurant and a guy a dead man literally almost literally falls in his lap right right and so pontius Pilate to me represents that kind of person who's just like look i don't want any trouble but he gets right right but the problem is Pilate, P-I-L-A-T-E, everybody thinks it's an exercise class. <laughs> Pilates. I can't tell me people have come up to me, like at a book signing, said, Pilates Cross, I really enjoy I'm like, thanks, hey. <laughs> uh, um, just, by the way, also Pilate. Well, Pilate, no, Pilate's spelled P-I-L-O-T. I had this conversation, believe it or not. Mm-hmm. And I said, mm-hmm. no, I said, no, he's not a, I said, technically, I guess you could read Pilate into it, that he's charting, you know, he's flying, but not really. I said, no, like, you know, you ever studied the Bible? Pilot. The guy. And sometimes people just, I just, I watch their eyes and they're just like, I don't, what? But it's fine. <laughs> but I got to the point where on the John Pilot Mysteries Facebook page, I even put on the about section, I said, just to be helpful, it's pronounced and there's a little pronunciation key. Pilot. Yeah. yeah it, it, and I, it's been, it's been that, but you know, what am I going to do? I can't change it. Um, <laughs> right. You know, I, I think though the next series character is going to be like Smith. Something a little easier to pronounce. Something just simple. <laughs> and of course, you know, a great name, Smith or Jones. You can write anything into that too. But no, but it's sure. it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> I did want to ask you a little bit about, I'll, I'll use the term the mysterious, but mm-hmm. uh, yeah. it, it's not a mystery. <laughs> a little, uh, <laughs> that yeah, you have a love for the mysterious. I do. Yeah. Personally. And then it, it within your books, you will weave in maybe some local legend you sure. talked about weaving in the supernatural or 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 religious uh, as well as 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 maybe a little bit of the unexplained uh, why, why do you find that important as a writer it's funny because you know in pilots cross there's and and by the way there's throughout the book there's a lot of pop culture stuff in there there's lines I mean, I, I use, I think we're going to need a bigger boat in Pilot's Key when they're being chased. And I use, right. so I mentioned things like Kolchak, the Night Stalker series. He, he pilots interior monologue and Pilot's Cross that gets mentioned because I think that was something growing up I was drawn to. I love Halloween. I still do. I loved scary shows. I still do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think it was something that my mom actually kind of didn't have a problem with me getting into. She, at times, would stay up late nights, and she would have the TV going, and she didn't really care what was on, I don't think. She was kind of doing her own thing, and, and I would be up, and uh, I remember watching reruns of The Night Stalker. I, I remember watching scary stuff, and uh, she she didn't discourage it. and But I've always also just thought, God, life is so much more interesting mm-hmm. um, when it doesn't play by the rules, right hmm. yeah that makes sense well there's yeah. all these rules about time and space and gravity and all that stuff fine um <laughs> but the idea that the idea though that there's something that defies that it's kind of a joke but not but i i'd like to believe that bigfoot is real sure it, because most science says it's probably not but uh, but a lot of science says it could be and right. and if it is real it means anything's possible to a degree to me. You know, right, ghosts. Right. I don't know about ghosts. I don't know if it's for real. I don't know if people are having psychosis. I don't know if it's some kind of energy right. echo. But mm-hmm. I hope it's real somehow. I don't I don't know right. if I hope that it that, and, that and not necessarily it's that it's ghosts, but that 
there are just things, unexplained things that happen and that we see and that we experience. The, and the, we, can't, we can't come up with a logical answer for. Right. The, the, the things that don't play by our set rules, or at least the rules today. But think about, think about the things that were the rules until the rules changed. Uh, mm-hmm. Think about all the different uh, – think about Einstein before Einstein. Then he changed the rules. You know, Hawking has changed sure. the rules to a degree. But there used to be so many rules about medicine and things like that. So right. I like that idea, and I, I don't put it in pilot series much. There's a touch of it, but I do talk mm-hmm. about it, and I do couch him in sometimes those situations, those kind of dark situations or – Right. One of my favorite things I ever wrote was kind of a rundown of all the, the weird stuff about Key West, like in the first or second chapter. Yeah, and so that was one thing I wanted to to maybe dive into mm-hmm. is – is so each of the books, I, I think you, you will throw John into a local area mm-hmm. and then weave in some local legend that may, right. if nothing else, add color to to the conversation – and add a, a, a kind of a mental visual to what the people are like in right. an area. So uh, we are, as a people, we are our legends too. And if in Key West, there's all these weird things that have happened. Like there was a guy who fell in love back in the day, like in the turn of the last century, he fell in love with this beautiful young woman. He was an older man, a doctor or, or, or something a little approaching a doctor. I don't remember. Count von Kossel, I believe, was his name, and he fell in love with this this girl, and you know she was he was like thirty years older than her, and she didn't want anything to do with him. But then she got TB, and shortly before she died, she went ahead and married him. I think maybe out of a financial thing for her family. Mm-hmm. And long story short, and you can read the book, uh, and they, there's more about it. But uh, family soon realized she's missing from her her tomb because everybody in Key West is buried above ground because right. Well, and she had a little right. tomb. Well, they they eventually find her, her mummified corpse, and the count had <laughs> been sleeping with his wife in more ways than one for a long mm. time. And I mean that kind of oh, you know thing because <laughs> there's that Great. saying all, all the nuts roll downhill to Florida, you know, and um, so so you have that, and then you have yeah. uh, you have just all these creepy these creepy things that have happened and i just think that right. that the, those again not playing by the rules things informs uh the story and it fires the imagination and it makes it more interesting i really really hope that that life is more interesting than it than, than, than daily life because daily life yeah. is boring and daily life is not interesting so so for for the books do you put john in an interesting locale and then research the legends or 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 does a legend that you stumble upon inspire you to to have pilot travel there well okay cross is kind of an obvious one i stumbled upon and 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 i also live there and i i I, sure sure. i've always been intrigued by the small town mystery and creepy you know thing Um, right but key as i mentioned last episode my Mm -hmm. wife and i uh spent part of our honeymoon there in Key West. And so then right. I, 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 but I took a tour there and I got to know the place. So it was kind of both. Sure. sure. And right, then so right. ghost that covers ghost. Um, but then in, in uh, Rose pilots, Rose Jamaica, mm-hmm. which by the way, sure. you were with me on the trip to you, I, our I, families. I, I was indeed. Yeah. So that was there. So then I, I did do a little bit there, but um, I got a, I got a little over my skis with that one, and I was really trying to really flesh it out and make the Jamaica parts bigger than it needed to be. And my editor saved me because that, Rose was a torturous book to finish for me; it just it wasn't <laughs> going anywhere. And yeah. uh, so we got through that. So I think that's the case. And the next book, which we'll mention before we go, is coming yeah. out on Halloween. It takes place totally in Key West again. The good okay. news is I had recently visited Antigua. And and uh, I've got some other places that are on my list, so uh, Pilot will probably go to some of those places too. Interesting. So you you mentioned uh, a, a, another potential uh, Pilot book after this. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I mean, do you see a like a finite end book? I do for the Pilot series, yeah. or 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 would you just kind of stop writing when it stops inspiring you? I would hope I would stop if it was just getting really 
terrible. You know, like if, mm-hmm. if it was like, oh, my God, he's just ticking the boxes and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and I was afraid that was happening a little bit, to be honest with you, with Rose, because I was really kind of really forcing it because I hadn't put anything out in a while. And I literally have a couple of fans who contact me and say, I have one lady, Miss Tony. She calls mm-hmm. me about every six months. When's the next book coming? She's, she's got my number. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, that, I mean. So I was like, oh, I got to get this done. But I was, I don't like the term blocked. I just, I just felt like I was having an imagination deficit and I was feeling like I was like, I don't have anything more to say here. But anyway, I've got a number in mind and we're halfway through. um, Basically, we're getting over the Terminator to the next second half of the series. At the rate I'm writing these, though, I'll be in my, I'll be just into my 60s when I'm done. Okay. And. I think by then I, I, it probably will be a good time. But Pilot kind of ages with me. He's a few years younger than me, but mm-hmm. but he's mm-hmm. gonna he ages as we move along here. He doesn't say the same age. And but I'll, I'll make a promise to readers: if it really sucks, I won't put it out. And if it and if, then if I <laughs> keep putting them out and people just stop reading them or, or reviewing or commenting, then I'll know. Sure, I'll know. Right, so, right. Somebody will let me know, and they'll uh, they'll they'll uh, they'll take me out behind the woodshed and do that last act that I need, you know, with yeah. the, with the one bullet type thing and say. Good, good dog. Good dog. Bye bye. <laughs> awesome. So, uh, with uh, with your upcoming book, yeah. So it's coming out on on Halloween, twenty nineteen, right? So, is there anything else about the the plot, the location that you'd like to share early? Just to let you know, the book. Let me just tell you what this is. Just this is a way we were going to do a big omnibus edition. We're going to put a two volume printed set of everything, including this new mm-hmm. adventure, together. And it was purely a dollars and cents thing where it was going to cost me a lot to put it together. And I still want to do it someday, but I just want to wait um, a little bit longer, maybe our ten or twenty years after that. Yeah, maybe when we're finally done with all of it, I'll put out a big slip cover, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. multi. But I. I I had a great friend. He's a fellow author. He also helps with uh, my ideas when I get dry, and he helps. He does great book covers for me, Jason McIntyre, and he and I were talking, and I said, oh, I want to do this omnibus, but I just can't pull it all together, and it's going to be money that I'm not sure I have, and I don't want to do another Kickstarter like I did for Pilot's Ghost, which was very successful, mm-hmm. but I just... I'm at a point where it's just like, I don't want to have hat in hand and expect people to, you know, money's tight for people, and I don't want sure. people to feel boxed in. So, because if people want to buy my stuff, they can buy it. So he said, well, how about this? Why don't you just take the new story? Because I'd got the new story done. And mm-hmm. it was not quite a full book. It's a novella size, you know? Okay. It's several thousand, you know, it's it's up there, but it's not a full, it's not like the usual 60,000 word book at all. It's like about, a, you know, 15 mm-hmm. or something. Why not tuck that in at the back of the last pilot book of, of Pilot's Rose and call it a 10th anniversary special edition? And ah, nice. fe- featuring the new story, which, by the way, is called Pilot's Shadow. Ah, very nice. Yeah. Very nice reveal. So, yeah, thank you yes. very much. Thank you. Uh, thanks for setting me up on that. And um, Pilot's Shadow is going to be at the back of Pilot's Rose. So what's going to happen is um, it's going to be out. By the time you hear this, it's going to be available on Halloween. And mm-hmm. it's paperback only. Okay. okay. So if you go to Kindle and buy Pilot's Rose on Kindle looking for this story, it's not going to be in there right away, okay? I'm, in fact, will probably only release this special edition probably as a print only. I would like you to buy the paperback. Um, okay. Pricing and everything will be on Amazon. Um, there'll be uh, there'll be an announcement on mgopod.com um, before Halloween about that. This ebook, the ebook version of just this story will come out probably next year. So if you want to wait, but I'd rather okay. you didn't. And it's not a guarantee, by the way. So you want to buy right, the right. you want to buy the book. Okay, buy the book. Pilot Shadow though is Key West, but it's it's like it's it's a tiny portion of Key West. It's a it's a it's a very intimate story with Pilot. Mm-hmm. It catches up within weeks of the ending of Pilot's Rose. Which, as we all know, if you've read Pilot's Rose, Pilot's Rose ended in a strange spot where you weren't sure whether he was going to live or die or, or come back or not. Well, obviously, he does. John does. And we meet a new antagonist. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to give too much away. Um, it's a quick okay. read. But I, I, I want you to know I'm very proud of it. And Correct. I think that if you're a Pilot fan, it's, it's must read. It's must read. Correct. And if you're not a Pilot fan... It's still a damn good read, in my opinion. Oops. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. So I want to, again, thank you for, uh, uh, you know, for letting us, letting me turn the tables and letting uh Letting? letting us... Are you kidding me? <laughs> I should pay you for this. <laughs> take, thank take you. A, uh, take a little peek 
uh, behind the scenes and uh, yeah. uh, you know your 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 process because uh, uh, it's very interesting. Oh, I mean, you. you know, it's very uh, you know, it's. I think there are some parallels to what I do on the product side, but yeah. but but also some you very unique things that that you do. Well, I appreciate that, and you know, because I understand your process. And if you haven't listened to the episode with Brian, go back. It's the uh, Restaurants Invisible Man. Ultimately, process is inspiration, just like you. But then it's also what you do. It's get your butt in the seat, and like for for you, it's sketching or whatever you do and research. For me, it's sure. research. It's writing, butt in seat writing. I have so many writers yeah. like, oh, I want to do this. I have a book in me, but blah blah blah. I'm like, well, you're never going to get it done unless you get your butt in the seat. You turn off the noise and you just write. So that's what I do, and I am. This is one of the few times when I'm be, ever being interviewed, so I just want to say this to everybody. <laughs> I'm deeply indebted to all of you, all of you readers, all of you listeners to this show. A lot of you listeners to the show probably don't even read the books. I know a couple of you don't or haven't. hope you will. But the thing is, I'm deeply indebted to you because, um, uh, like my grandfather, you know, he never had great riches. He had success as a writer, and I've had some success, but I don't have great riches. But that's not really why I do it, and that's not a cliche. It's true. I do it because I, I like to express myself. I like to entertain other people, um, mm-hmm. and you just you all make it really worthwhile. And uh, as long as you're reading, I'm still writing. <laughs> awesome, awesome. So again, t- 10th anniversary mm-hmm. of uh, of the pilot series and the new book, Pilots Shadow. Mm-hmm. Coming out uh, in paperback on uh, on Halloween, October thirty first, two thousand nineteen. Very scary, kids. Yeah, thanks again, Alex. And it's uh, as always a pleasure to speak with you, you. and I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. So until next time, you'll be back in this seat. Keep reading. Whiteout conditions. I haven't seen a blizzard like this in 50 years. You'd have to be crazy to go outside tonight. Small towns keep their secrets, sometimes for decades, until an outsider dares to ask questions. The president of Cross College was assassinated by a professor who turned the gun on himself in November 1963. Why? Well, that's a $64,000 question, isn't it? When John Pilot moved to faraway Cross Township, He left behind a life he was eager to forget. His new job at Cross College would be a quiet place to rebuild his life, or so he thought. Sometimes small towns reveal more than secrets to outsiders, and what was meant to be simple can easily become complicated. John, I want to be with you, but I don't think you're going to stay in Cross for long. And a mystery can be as powerful and irresistible as love. There's something going on here, and it's all tied to the murder of the Cross College president in 1963. John, it's not your concern. You really don't fit in here. For your own sake, get out of Cross while you can. And Pilot may self-destruct on his own if his imaginary pal Simon gets his way. Why not end this? Escape this veil of tears? Shovel off this mortal coil? Take the dirt now. Of all the imaginary friends in the world, I have to get the psycho who wants me dead. Everyone needs a hobby. The small town of Cross gets smaller as Pilot zeroes in on the decades-old conspiracy. What happens to a person's ashes if nobody claims them? And makes himself a target. Ultimately, this outsider will have to survive the elements, outsmart the conspirators, and overcome his personal demons. John Pilot will learn that washing his hands of murder isn't easy, 